Morning. If you weren't in the summer school, you missed a very good video. And uh, one of those moments where you take a bit of a big step forward in your understanding. And uh, and uh, I recommend you get the DVD if you didn't if you didn't see it. I've been thinking this week about some of the patriarchs, some of the great people from God's word, from the history of back in time, way back from the beginning, I uh, kind of thought of Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And as I read these names, I want you to think about each one and think about what they shared in common. Job, Moses, and Aaron. Esther was mentioned this morning, and her cousin Mordecai. Elijah and Elisha, David, Solomon, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, Jonah. What was something they shared in common? Something that I realized about them was they had massive influence in their time with governors, pharaohs. They actually changed history. They were ordinary people, but by standing for the truth in their time, by trusting in their God and by obeying him, Stepping up, they had a massive influence on how history went in their time and even to our time. You know, there's a direct line from Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah and Shem. Direct line of truth. They talked to one, talked to the next, and they passed on the truth. And Abraham... By the time we get to Abraham, he lived in a time of almost universal paganism. People sacrificed their babies to appease pagan gods. And uh, I'm grateful that we don't live in those times. And it hasn't got that bad in our time. But do you think they had to be brave? All of those people. Christian faith, you know, faith in God is not for namby-pambies, is it? These people stood for the truth in a difficult time. So I wanted to focus really on one young lady called Esther. And it's an amazing book, Esther, because it doesn't mention God. But I want you to turn, if you would, to Esther. And um, I'd love to read you the whole story, but you'd probably get bored with my voice. Uh, chapter 2. You know the story. Um, Vashti, the queen at the time, Xerxes' queen, refused to come to his party and parade herself in front of his, his drunk friends. And uh, so he got pretty upset about this. And um, from my reading this week, I understand he was planning some military excursions and he had, you notice he had all the military... Um, people at the party he, and, he, and this um, parading of his wife would have kind of he hoped encouraged loyalty but she refused and so he said right we're going to get rid of her she's never going to come into my house again and uh, somebody suggested why don't we get a new queen so they went looking all around the kingdom for the best looking girls and Esther, a young Jewish girl, was in the group. She was called in too. It doesn't really say how, whether it was whether he was uh, she was pushed into it or she volunteered. But let's have a look here. Her, her, her Jewish name was Hadassah, wasn't it? Starting at the beginning, later when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. 
Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. All through the story, this king takes advice and follows it. He doesn't really think for himself much, I don't think. Now there was, was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among, whose, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favour. I think they are beauty contests or stacked. Immediately he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. So, you know the, how the story goes. There was the other man in the story, Haman who happened to be from where? What was his descendants? Uh, hang on a minute. He, he was an Agagite. Did, did you realize that? Who was, who was an Agag? Remember who Agag was? A king who Saul was supposed to get rid of. And he got in trouble from the prophet Samuel and from God because he never disposed of King Agag. And somehow one of his descendants survived, Haman. There's probably more too, but Haman hated the Jews. And he particularly hated Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Now Mordecai didn't hate Haman, but Mordecai had a king who was greater and his name was God. Jehovah. And he, he wouldn't bow down to any man. He wasn't being disrespectful. He wasn't being disrespectful to Haman. But Haman read it as that. But Haman had this desire to be worshipped, didn't he? Chapter 3, that's what I was looking for. First few verses. After these events, King Xerxes honoured Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honour higher than all of the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the kingdom. Yeah, why just get rid of one? So he, he uh, was very egotistical, wasn't he? And, and you see on the other side, Esther, very reluctant. And, uh, but the opportunity was there. They, the whole Jewish nation who lived in, in, under this king went into mourning. They all sat down in ashes and sackcloth and mourned because they it was a day set Haman set a day when he was going to kill them all and they cried and prayed and fasted and mourned and Mordecai 
in chapter 4, Mordecai talks to Esther. And, uh, now, well, let's go back. When Mordecai, I start at the beginning of chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he only went as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sock, sackcloth and ashes, when Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. So then down in verse... Uh, 8, he, he, Mordecai tried to get the message to Esther, because she was living in the king's uh, palace now to explain to her and show her that she needed to go and beg for mercy and plead for her people and she said in verse 11 all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned the king has but one law that he be put to death the only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life but 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. And then these famous words. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. So Esther was a... Even though she was shy, and it's like coming up here to speak, actually. You always feel like you're way out of your depth. But uh, we, we, uh, we come up here because God is great, you know, and, and, and he supplies these amazing uh, ideas. And they, She knew that there was someone greater than her, someone greater than the king, and she just had to pray. So she, not just pray, but fast. It was urgent. So they prayed and fasted, didn't they? So yeah, here's these faithful Jews living in this uh, very challenging situation. They were ordinary until they were tested, right? And that's just like us, isn't it? <laughs> I hope. You know, when I was young, I don't know if some of you my age might remember a singing group called The Seekers. I just want to talk a little bit about how the world's changed. The Seekers had some songs like this. Sinner Man. When the stars begin to fall. Remember that? We shall not be moved. These were pop songs that did really well in the charts. Uh, turn, turn, turn. Know that one? There is a time for every season straight out of Ecclesiastes. You know, my school, I brought my little school songbook. Somehow it's been preserved. When I was at Intermediate, the cover's gone, but I made my own cover. And uh, this is... Mm, this is in the late 60s, right? 40... 40 uh, Forty-seven hymns in the front. Awake my soul. Fight the good fight, the king of love. Jesus lives, immortal, invisible, God only wise. This is my school songbook. You know, there's those other ones like the Campdown races, but there in the front of it is 47 hymns. And I also got one of these. I don't know if you did. 
a New Testament given to me by my school. Now, I don't know, I'd love to talk to you kids about this. Times have changed, haven't they? Christianity, you know, at least the principles and the values used to influence society a lot more than they do now. Now, Christianity is mocked. You know, by the educated people. Today we give knighthoods to brewers and we mock the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They're basically the only voice that's standing up and speaking against alcohol. The world view of the general population has changed in 50 years. And uh, so the world seems to be moving away from Christian faith in the Bible. So what sort of results would you expect moving away from God who is love you're only going to go in one direction towards Satan right let me show you in Isaiah what the Bible says about Satan Lucifer as he was known in heaven you wouldn't name your child Lucifer but do you realize God gave him that name and we only associate it with evil now, don't we? Isaiah 14. Verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. In the King James, it, does, it doesn't say morning star, it says Lucifer, doesn't it? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly. See that? He wants to be right in church. On the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Just like Haman. He wanted to be worshipped. Ezekiel 28 is the other one. A prophecy spoken to another king but directed at Satan Ezekiel 28 13 you were in Eden the garden of God see the king of Tyre wasn't in Eden but God was speaking to Lucifer through this prophecy you were in Eden the garden of God every precious stone adorned you ruby, topaz and emerald chrysolite, onyx and jasper sapphire, turquoise and beryl your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created they were prepared you were anointed as a guardian cherub for so I ordained you you were on the holy mount of God you walked among the fiery stones you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you 17 your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And this is what's going to happen. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuary. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you. What was Satan's problem? He desired worship. His beauty, which God gave him, became all encompassing. He believed he deserved better than what he had. So it says there in Revelation 12, and a lot of people have uh, associated the story of Esther with Revelation, the last days. Revelation 12. You see the story of the, the pure woman and she has gives birth to a child who we know as Christ from the description there. And, and the woman is always understood to be the church, God's church. And she gives birth to this, this child who's going to rule, but Satan gets ready to devour the child as soon as it's born. And you know what happened when he was born. Satan almost did devour him, but God intervened. And then... It says in verse 17, the last, verses, the last verse of chapter 12, the dragon 
was enraged at the woman and went to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So there's a war between the devil and the church. You know, and I came into the church and I heard about this and I thought, wonder where this war is. Doesn't feel like a war. <laughs> But it's a war of ideas, isn't it? You can't shoot Satan. It's not going to do any good. And the war in heaven that God had with Satan, with Lucifer, was a war of ideas, right? What's going to win? Who's going to win? Which government do we want? So it's not, a, not about guns and bombs, but uh, there's war, and I think it does us good to realize we're in a war and so some of the ways that we go about war some of the what are some of the tactics of war can you think of I heard. sorry oh sorry i can't understand you oh lies right yeah yeah propaganda was the word I had. Yes, very good. Propaganda is a, is a tactic of war. Not just war, it's a tactic of, you know, changing society. This is how you change people's thinking. Propaganda is a classic. Camouflage. And important to communicate. I made a mistake this morning, Dave, sorry. I should have communicated. Communication when you're at war, it's very important. So you just think about this war we're in, right? And the camouflage. Oh, let me read you a survey. How the devil uses camouflage. Two international surveys were conducted during 91 and 93 by the International Social Survey Programme. And this is the University of Chicago. In 91, subjects were asked to agree or disagree with a number of statements. One was, I definitely believe in the devil. The percentage who answered yes were, in the United States, 45%. New Zealand's in fifth place down here, 21%. Yes, I definitely believe there's a devil. And it goes right down to like 3%. It appears that Satan is considered alive and well only by large numbers of the public in the U.S. and Northern Ireland. However, these numbers are dropping. In the U.S., from 91 to 2007, belief in Satan as a living entity dropped from 35% to 24%. Satan is, this is how he's portrayed in modern culture, right? Satan is a rather humorous character with a tail dressed in a red suit smelling of brimstone and carrying a pitchfork. His prime activity appears to be to roam all over the earth trying to persuade individuals to sign a contract which sells their soul to him in exchange for special powers or wealth. Satan does not seem to be particularly intelligent because he's easily tricked by humans. He's a type of warden who has administrative responsibilities over hell where some individuals go after death to be tortured for all eternity. That's not true, is it? So most of the people's understanding of Satan, even if they believe he's real, is completely off the truth. What about communication? We live in the age of communication. We have our mobile phone in our pocket. We are available every moment. I'm not sure about you, Grant. Have you got coverage? <laughs> Out there in the bush? <laughs> Good. It's, that's what I love about Tui Ridge. You can't, you can't be reached. <laughs> but let me read to you. I don't know if you've been watching. I was going to put some pictures up and show you. Um, there was a massacre. Six people were killed recently by a young man in the States. And um, it was pretty horrifying because he went and put videos on YouTube just before he did it, right? I don't know if any of you saw it on the news or... Pretty horrifying. Uh, his name was Elliot Roger. 
son of a movie director. His dad helped to make the movies, um, Hunger Games movies, which I haven't seen, but I've heard they're very good. You know, and now after I've read this, I don't really want to see them. But young people really loved those movies, and apparently. They were a series that depicted young people killing each other as a survival sport in a dystopian police state society. But the media didn't really talk about the background of Elliot. They, they said he had mental problems. He'd always been distant from his family. He possibly was autistic. He never fitted in. And they never really talked about him being a product of the media programming that we are all surrounded by, right? I don't know if you, you can actually get his whole manifesto, 140 pages online if you want to read it. I only read the first page and I was shocked how he believed that he was superior to everyone else. He deserved all the best things in life, especially women, and none of them responded to his goodness so he killed them and uh, ended up killing himself. But horrific uh, story, really. And I don't think he's going to be the last because we live in this age when we're taught, you know, through the media, it's great to be materialistic, have as many things as you can, be better than everyone else. You are very important. Uh, Adam Langford, the author of the story in the Daily Mail, said Elliot Roger was trying to act out the role of a film star when he went on his killing spree. Imagine how different the outcome might have been if he'd found inspiration from something like a church group or volunteering to help people. And I was a bit shocked to learn this because I love Facebook. Facebook prefers you to read about serial killers rather than anything really important. As all popular websites with a large number of Facebook followers already know, Facebook severely limits the number of your follow followers who see your posts. This came from a website called Natural News. Natural News, <coughs> because Natural News has over 1.1 million Facebook fans, many of our posts are strictly limited, but not when we posted this story about a serial killer. Facebook allowed the story to be seen widely, and the story went immediately viral within seconds, exploding our website traffic. Interesting, isn't it? It's not just Hollywood that hopes you're steeped in stories of mass murder and psychopathic killers. It's the people who control social media. You are being programmed from every angle. Well, I know some of you aren't because you don't bother with it. <laughs> but that's the way... That's the world we live in, isn't it? <clears throat> We're surrounded with the stuff. So the, what are the results? <clears throat> what are the results of a world that moves away from God? Let me read some of this. I, I uh, smiled when I read this, because some of you will remember too. <clears throat> when we were young, we put out empty glass milk bottles outside the front gate each night along with the money for tomorrow's milk. If we didn't have the exact coinage, we'd place a dollar note halfway under one of the empty bottles so it couldn't be blown by the wind, but in plain view for the milkman. By morning, we'd find in its place our milk along with the right change. Young people, does that seem realistic? That's crazy, isn't it? Everyone else in the street did the same thing. But no one does it anymore, do they? <clears throat> and, you know, you just don't leave money on the street. That's nuts. And I don't know if you've been watching. My wife loves watching these hospital programs with all the blood and surgery and stuff. <clears throat> when I'm eating my dinner. And... Uh, there's been one on St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Um, and I've seen this guy's name, Dr. George Gordian. Dr. Gordian Fold. He's the head of emergency. He said, people have become more violent and angry at each other for very little, if any, reason. And it is just 
scary how people are being hit, people are being stomped on. I mean, that's just a term which, if you really think about it, is unthinkable. Where somebody's on the ground unconscious and still there's several people kicking somebody who is obviously defenseless. He said, I think we've just, it comes down in my opinion, we've become a more angry, violent, vicious society. If you turn anywhere, be it the news, be it the video games, be it anything else, even a football match, you know what really is put up there first is somebody's had a terrible tackle or a head clash. We seem to be fascinated by violence and I think a lot of it is fed to children and all of us all the time. Seven hundred and sixty one patients were admitted to public hospitals in Brisbane after being hit, struck, kicked, twisted, bitten or scratched by another person between two thousand eleven and two thousand twelve. Dr. Anthony Lynham. Unless somebody does something at the primary prevention level, we're just going to keep getting, pouring more and more money at this level, and it's ridiculous. You want me to go around putting titanium plates in your kids' faces? Well, the way things are going, it's just going to keep going. It's a lack of respect from one human being for another. I think we have to go back to some old-fashioned values. I'm not sure where they think they're going to come from, because Christianity doesn't factor in, does it? But it's a natural result of the way the world's gone. Richard, Richard Lewinton from Harvard University wrote regarding schools in the USA, evolution was barely mentioned in textbooks as late as 1954. After Sputnik, the study of evolution was suddenly in all the schools. Over the next decade, evolutionary curricula spread from the USA and became the norm in most Western countries, filtering from the evolutionary-focused university system right down to primary school level and often to the children's parents. As a result, the background thinking of people regarding politics, religion and morality changed dramatically as well. It's got a picture here of someone drowning and these two guys standing on the riverbank. One says, it's an illusion. And the other one says, your karma just kicked in. You know, we're in a sick world, and um, when you listen to the news, you'll actually hear that crime rates are falling. And they are in some, in some ways, and let's, I'll tell you how. There's a threat of leaving behind DNA, isn't there? And CCTVs everywhere. So they, those two things alone have stopped certain crimes. But there's far more sophisticated investigative tools now. You know, far, far more sophisticated crimes. On the internet, where all manner of fraud is rife, such as stealing passwords and raiding bank accounts, criminal gangs raid bank ATMs using devices, corporate crime, drug cartels, take extraordinary measures in moving their product around the world. Prominent UK atheist A.C. Grayling recently joked, you can see we no longer really believe in God because all of the CCT cameras keep watching on us. It's true, isn't it, remember? When I, when I grew up, we thought God was watching us. And he is. <laughs> it's a great way to live. Can we live the way we live? If God's watching us. So, you know, Elliot Roger really is just a result. He's just a natural result of a, a world that's moved away from God. So, as we heard on the video this morning, the world's cursed, isn't it? Not because God cursed it, but because of the, the results of moving away from him. Selfishness rules. God predicted this. Does our community still need Jesus' love? Unselfishness, I think it does. And what we offer, I believe what we offer is, this, is the answer to this problem. Just like the ordinary people in Scripture who change history by their faith, we are influencing people around us. 
for good, for evil. So are you a secret agent? God doesn't have any secret agents. We need to blow our cover. Jesus needs you, needs me, to show people his love. Jesus, I've found, is always where people need something, especially where they need good news. And uh, that's why you find, I don't know if you've ever listened to literature evangelists telling their stories, they working, they're always out there working where Jesus is. That's why they have such a good life, isn't it, Joy? <laughs> that's why it's such an exciting work, because you're kind of out there where Jesus is, helping people. And, uh, and, it's, not, and it's only for the brave, though. So Jesus needs you. And I think, but the secret is, just in closing, the secret is not to go out and knock on doors tomorrow. The secret is to get close to Jesus, isn't it? And I realized listening to the man talking on the video this morning, I need to study my Bible more because, man, that was amazing. We need to spend more time with Jesus, and that's why I've chosen the closing hymn, 487, in the garden. You know, At that time with him each day is the thing that would make us into the witness that he wants. So let's sing together. I come to the garden alone. Thank you, Mary. Father, we are amazed at how your love for us, you knew us, and yet you loved us and saved us. We are amazed at your goodness. Lord, uh, may we commit to making more time for you in these coming days as Jesus' return gets closer. May we subtract unnecessary things out of our lives to make time with you. 
that we can grow to be the, the uh, faithful witnesses that you wanted us to be. And uh, thank you for trusting us with your message of good news. Please empower us to go and tell the people around us how good you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.